Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for taking this time of your, of, out of your week uh, to come and listen to what would no doubt be an interesting discussion. My name is Sibonia Lombardani. I'm a work official assistant curator for sculpture here at Zach Mocha. And I'm Marika Timbias, the Mikhail Kamras and Frederick O. Sen assistant curator of sculpture at Zach Mocha. It is our great honor and privilege to, to have with us today Mengiswa Kunta, who is here to talk about the creative processes involved in her artistic practice. As you may be aware, this discussion centers on her work currently on display in Zeitzmacher, focusing on home as a conceptual thread which has been carried through her bodies of work. Um, as a short introduction, Lumiswa Kunta recently graduated from the Mekela School of Fine Art and forms part of uh, the Kriya Collective, a South African-based network of young black female artists. Before starting the discussion, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the rest of the curatorial team, the registrar department, and those in communication for their ongoing support, as well as everyone else involved most notably Lengiswa, for taking time out to be here with us today. And um, lastly, I'd like to thank the Sharon Art Collection for donating this space. Hi, hi Lengiswa, once again. Thank you very much for being here. It's an honor to have you. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> uh, just want to break the ice a bit. Uh, as a young South African artist, could you tell us a bit more about yourself in terms of your background and artistic practice? Mm. Um, okay, so it's me. Hi to everyone. Um, okay, my background. I was born in New Brighton, Port Elizabeth. And yeah, and I've only uh, just recently moved to Cape Town about four years ago. Um, and so I kind of studied arts at NMMU. And I finished my, um, my degree there. And then I came to UCT to do my masters. There was a shift in my artistic practice from from NMU to to UCT, um, and it was a shift in terms like in terms of material, but also in terms of content. Because coming into a new place, having to navigate, I, I just started making work about. Um, about my experience in Cape Town, basically, and, and that's the kind of work that people are most familiar with, is like, it's the last four years and how the last four years treated me. So, yeah. What else do I want to talk about? So my next question is about your two bodies of work. Um, so looking at your exhibitions, Home of Residue, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like looking at like old work that I'm trying to forget it. Oh, <laughs> I can see microphones are acting up. Um, yeah. So looking at your exhibitions, Home of Residue, in which right. you create burnt sculptures from, well, sculptural pieces from burnt furniture, and your 2016 body of work, Kokobe, which is currently housed in the museum, in which you use various familiar objects from a domestic environment, such as bed sheets, bed frame, and where you created a little room divider with your piece called the divider. Um, my question is about how your concept or your notion of home has developed from these two bodies of work. Um, okay, so in the home of residue, um, so the burn pieces that you see there are actually um, pieces of warped wood that were discarded that I kind of took upon myself to kind of just uh, make work. And that body of work was literally kind of, the, that was the first year in Cape Town having no friends, no family, knowing absolutely no one struggling to find a great like a place to stay because rent is ridiculous out here. Is it working? Um, yeah. 
think maybe we should just use this one. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm gathering my thoughts. So the the work the work I was making was me just kind of a response to being away from home for the first time in my life and having to figure myself out and kind of um, navigate the space and it was literally I just was not coping for a good part of the year and 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 I was making work and I was thinking a lot about home and my family and I was recalling very fond memories and to make myself feel more comfortable and to kind of have ownership and claim the space that I was in, which was at Michaela's, I I just started making work that kind of embodied very special memories of home for me. And so I started making, well the first thing I made was a throne. And I made a like an incredibly tall throne and and I wanted to make that piece specifically so that anyone who walks into the space, that's the first thing you see, it's the last thing you remember. But also just in terms of me and like my presence and to kind of show people also like my mentality and how I see myself. So I, I was asserting myself essentially. And then all the other work that came from there, um, like this one, the birds and the bees, was just, I mean, that one came about when like I actually first hit puberty <laughs> and it was I found out through a mirror literally that sorry I'm getting hella person. Yeah. <laughs> I just like kind of found out like, you know, when you first have your period, um, it was like a big hoo ha with your friends and I literally found out through my reflection in this particular mirror that was in my room. So and I remember having my mom like having come back from work. And then she was like, okay, now we need to talk about birds and bees. And so that's, you know, those are the kinds of things that I just kind of held on to when I miss my mother. I like, I miss a certain thing. I miss, there's, there's one that's like a record player called the blues. And I just, you know, it's just kind of creating um, objects that house or with vessels for very good memories of home just so that I can actually mentally and emotionally cope with the space and with everything um, and with just kind of being displaced from home and so yeah the, um, so that was the home of Resid you with the brand works and then in Kokobe that was about two years two years later there was a two-year gap and by this time every I've been in Cape Town for like three years and every single year I struggle <laughs> to find a place to stay, and I would, and it would just, it kept on getting worse, and so it was just every first three months of the year was an emotional time for me, of trying to find a place, not having a place, and everything that comes, that comes with it, and so when I was when I was making Gobobe, I was looking at this whole struggle that I keep, like this whole block that I keep getting of trying to find a place. Um, a place to stay and the difficulty and why is it so difficult and why is it like every year it just gets worse and worse so I just started thinking about um, home and and where so obviously I would go back home to New Brighton and I was like it, and I was living in town here in Cape, in Cape Town so you can imagine like my surroundings everything is different like it's a huge jump to living in like southern suburbs to living in a township, to going back to the southern suburbs. So that whole jolt was just like, okay, this is ridiculous. And so I kind of was like, well, this actually ties into everything that I'm making work about. How do we still have townships existing today? Like, how are we still living under the same systems of oppression? And everybody wants to think that, oh, progress, but like, they're making progress on a surface level. Home is a foundation, and our foundation is still messed up. And our foundation, we're building families and townships, so I cannot see how we're not dealing with the foundation. Like The whole thing of segregation is an extremely important part because it feeds into everything. And so that's when I was making Google, when I kind of thinking about the history of where I come from, New Brighton, and how it came about. 
and and then I and then <coughs> looking at not only segregation but like what um, outcomes you know like segregation like left and are still that we're still actually having to deal with in this generation today and one of them was being alcohol and so yeah I'm just kind of looking at like further and looking at alcohol as another system of oppression put on black people within the, in the townships so and obviously my work has that link of I I mean as part of my upbringing I grew up in like um, a Shabin for first seven years of my life, my house was a should be like, you know, it was a public private kind of negotiation of space. So, and it's just, and I think uh, that's the kind of like a theme that goes throughout my, my whole work is just this kind of um, being caught between the, the public and the private, like not ever fully having any kind of ownership of space. And so, um, and the divider is, is a work that um, comes from me thinking and recalling how a person enters my home. Um, and so my home was kind of built in like two parts. So there's like a passageway that runs through half of it. And so the, part, the place on the right was my home and the other place was where people would go to drink. And so the divider is in the shape of the passageway of how one can enter the, the front part of my house all the way to the back, but just also looking at alcohol as a divider in itself and the effects that it has had on families such as mine and other families because definitely growing up I witnessed a lot of families crumble, I witnessed alcohol taking a lot of things and I, I mean as much as it, it gave, you know, in terms of opportunity and like our, our parents being able to send us to good schools, it also took away a lot in the sense that you know you have people who are still fighting this disease of alcoholism and yeah just kind of so all so all of this i found like this is this is all coming from me still trying to find a place to live and having lived in Gualanga for like the first month having to travel all the way to town and i just i just don't i don't get it I don't get it. And this is why there's this, like a slight aggression in the work. And this work is supposed to have petrol inside it in the installation, which unfortunately it doesn't have here. But it's supposed to have petrol in terms of, like, for the sake of people feeling the discomfort that we actually live amongst on a daily basis. And that is why I, I, I try and always make my work an experience of discomfort, an experience of having to constantly be aware of where you're walking and where you are. As a black person, we, we navigate town in all of these spaces, always being made to feel like, okay, either you're out of place or you should know your place or, you know, the, you, you're never comfortable. You're never comfortable. And so I wanted my work to speak of the same kind of experiences that I and my other friends um, that we go through basically. So yeah, so like it, it came, it became a little bit more like focused and more political because I'm, I'm, I'm resisting against these these structures that are still in place. And until there's there's a shift, there's a change. I don't see how I can be speaking about something else when I'm still going back, traveling all the way back and going back in the, in the township, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So, and I, I just don't understand how it's not a very urgent topic to everybody because I feel it's very urgent to me because I live amongst it, you know? So, yeah, I hope I've answered your question. Very well, thanks. Okay. Should we try with the mic? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> uh, I just want to refer to your installation title, The Divide, and focus on the technical aspect of it. Um, the bottles, the, manner in, the way in which they are suspended varies. Some are suspended at eye level, whilst all, some are almost touching the floor. Does that sort of contribute towards your conceptual narrative? No. <laughs> it definitely doesn't. 
Um, so I mean, like this this concept, but also there's just like formal qualities of the work that I appreciate, and I I mean, I, it, those things kind of like take turns, and so the the height of the bottles is just like a formal thing of like, does this look good to me? And yeah, so it, yeah. I mean, it looks all right, but <laughs> it changes every it changes every time. Also, I allow myself to like some flexibility in how I install work. Um, every time I install a work, uh, it always changes slightly, and I quite like that. It changes in terms of the space that it's in, and and also depending on how I'm like feeling that day. Um, so yeah, no formal, no conceptual. Thing. Thank you for your explanation about two bodies of work. Um, but I have my, my next question is also about the divider. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I feel the strength of your work is the fact that it's multi-layered um, and that there are various interpretations that one can take out of them. For instance, one interpretation that I've heard sees the coiled or the cords of the bed sheets as umbilical as you know, like umbilical cords going into these empty bottles, and that relates to the DOP system, which is still in place in our country, and the ridiculous of the ridiculousness of that, and the fact that the Western Cape has the highest percentage of fetal alcohol syndrome in the country, or pretty much almost in the world. Um, what I want to ask is. What do you think about this interpretation of your work? Is, are you open to these <coughs> readings, or do you want people to kind of have a specific insight into your work? Want to comment on that? Um, like firstly, I have no control <laughs> over that, uh, over how people take the work, and definitely I'm open to it. Um, you know, it's also very interesting, like, I mean, I wish you ever interpreted that people like, was there to write my masters, because that was gold. <laughs> that was gold, I would have done so well. Um, <laughs> but, no, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a really, really interesting point, and like, it's beautiful when I hear such interpretations, because it definitely feeds into the work, and it's not far off, so all of these things kind of add on to the work, and, um, uh, yeah, what I originally was doing with the ropes and uh, um, the bed sheets, collecting them and tying them together, literally I spent my whole year or two making petrol bombs. So this is kind of like an extended version of it. Um, any <laughs> or any bottle with a cloth in my work, you must know it's a bomb. <laughs> that you must know. It's a, it, it will look different, it will change form, it'll, it'll, and I'm always trying to kind of play around with it and not just to be just so straightforward sometimes because, you know, it can scare a lot of people away and I'm just trying to lure people and then shock them when they get there. So, um, yeah, these, these are like a, just a whole divider of petrol bombs, but um, that's interpretation you had, like I said, it's a very beautiful, very sad one, mm. also, um, which also just kind of is another thing that the city <laughs> needs to, you know, this, this place, um, <laughs> you know, I'm yeah. sorry, like, this, this city gets me, but, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah, but, yeah, um, Um, this question concerns Hata. Can you just go to Hata? <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's a work consisting of carefully placed stones on a wooden relief craving of New Brighton, balanced up onto SAB, cra SAB beer crate. As it references the children's game, was it your intention to add an element of playfulness or evoke subconscious childhood memory? Okay, so first it's pronounced uh, Yeah, mm. it's like when you try and like take something and your mom like smacks your head. Yeah, she she knows like Ada. That's so that's the whole kind of thing behind it. 
and definitely those yeah. ones are not replaced but like <laughs> I just chuck them and <laughs> hope they stay within the map but I mean that's the game the game was just it was carefree the you know what you could play it by yourself or with friends and um, yeah so yeah that that the element of playfulness and uh, a game I I wasn't doing it consciously just I kind of always I'm like thinking of like just growing up and at one stage I was just thinking about this game and like and I was just thinking about movement of people mm -hmm. and I thought about this game and I was like you it's like the original one it's just it's the same it's just like a circle and a bunch of rocks and you have one and the aim is to throw it and get you know like to keep two rocks of it. every time you put it in you must leave a specific number of rocks and like catch the stone at the same time and so so that's the game like you can kind of play and i thought about that whole movement of like taking putting back also leaving behind and like how the rocks scatter and i it just literally clicked in like you know like movement of people like i just saw the rocks as you know people and communities and i saw the hand or the player or the person as um like the forcibly like the force removing people you know without their consent so i mean like in that in that instance it's like colonialism playing with a whole bunch of black people they don't need to work with so that was the whole thing and just kind of looking at New Brighton and how people were forcibly removed and scattered all over the place and it just made sense like for me and it just I couldn't look or think about the game in any other way and for me I was like for anyone who's played the game and to to kind of associate it to movement like I, I thought that was a nice way to kind of get somebody to think about um, forced removals in a different way, you know. I mean, it's very, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly painful thing to think about and, and then link to something so innocent as like just childhood and things like, yeah, like that. But, you know, I mean, children are a part of that. You know, children are a part of that, um, that movement that is forced on them. Children, yeah. So I just, that, I mean, also just conceptually, I just like the idea of, you know, sometimes people don't want to talk about uh, very painful things, very um, controversial things. They stray away. So I always try and kind of like trick them into into thinking that work or the, whatever it is I'm showing is not as deep as it is. And so I, I always I, I'm trying to kind of figure out a way to get people's attention and I'm and this is me just kind of like problem solving or trying different languages basically through my work to articulate an experience and to bring forth a, a point and to start a conversation and so yeah I, I, I use whatever kind of methods kind of make sense you know either making something look beautiful while it's handy or playful but in essence I mean all of that it's just, it, it's carrying a lot of things. So the next question relates to this piece of yours, Untitled. Um, and once again with the multiple la layers that I find within your work, I just want to ask, um, in relation to the bed frame and the fragments of ripped bed sheets, the broken beer bottles can mean a number of things, I feel. Um, what do they specifically mean to you? Don't or, you want to tell me what they mean to you? Okay, sure. There are like various interpretations. Um, as South Africa, or as a South African, you often see broken beer bottles on the um, fences or on the concrete fences around houses or around property as a means to protect the um, residents in place of barbed wire, or it can be a remnant of a violent encounter with someone who perhaps threw a beer bottle. It can speak about a, <coughs> the remnants of an exploded petrol bomb, what was left over, not that I've ever seen that. Um, 
I don't know if the whole bottle completely explodes or if <laughs> the next left over. But I mean, in relation to the bed, it could also speak of, you know, the it can juxtapose the comfort and security of the bed that a bed offers, the feminine um, patterns of these beautiful pink flowers, juxtaposed with these sharp edges of the broken bottles. That speaks of something quite specific, I feel. And that's what I'd just like to ask you, what that specific thing is. If you could answer that. Um, okay, so, yeah, I mean, the broken bottles are definitely um, a representation or like, a, like are speaking to security mm. and, you know, walls as means of security, but also like to exclude that whole, you know, so it's always like including or excluding and, um, and obviously these are very specific to townships. So it's not just any residence, it's residents in the township areas. Because in the bougie areas, there's electric fences. So, <laughs> and I don't know nothing about those. So I was making reference to the security of the home and securing the home and in doing in securing the home, like what is it that you're trying to to keep out, you know, and like always just thinking about like um, borders and these razor wires and all of these fences. I mean they it, it works both ways, you know. Um, so I I kind of um, the the inclusion of the bed sheets was just kind of you know, whenever I make something and all the work has kind of just, or the recent work has had a very kind of specific and very soft color palette. And, you know, women as part of resistance and um, women in the, in, the, in the role of like, as I spoke earlier about like children being part of these, you know, people who are forcibly removed. And I'm just kind of coming up from a point of, being a black woman, being raised by a lot of black women, most of these works are just me having talks with my aunt and finding out. So these experiences are all like from women. So unconsciously, it works its way into my work through fabric, through color, through 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 texture, and so that's that's the and those are like my mom's bed sheets that she was never never pleased with me taking. But she, <laughs> I promised her it was for a good cause. <laughs> um, but so, and like I always try and, and, and whatever work I make, try and put something for myself that is per like um, very personal. Um, that, so that, you know, in all of the interpretations of the work and whatever, I can always see myself and see my family and know exactly where I was any time that work shows wherever in the world that I can always just find myself in there. And so, um, yeah, so yeah, and the, the single bed frame, the, the bed just also is kind of like a reoccurring element in the work because it's, it, it's, it's easy to kind of connect to home. So first thing you think about bed, home, you know, um, and so it's just me kind of continuing that idea of like thinking of home and security and uh, possibly even violence within the home, um, you know, via alcohol abuse and all of those things. So, but, yeah, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into that. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll refer to a video installation title, wait for it. <laughs> Yes, that features a homemade uh, petrol bomb endlessly swaying from side to side. Uh, so my question is, what is the it that a viewer is waiting for? Revolution. <laughs> They're waiting for the land back. They're waiting for change, man. And you, I mean, the petrol bomb is, I feel such a very beautiful object mm. and I always want to keep it in my work as a sign of resistance but also I mean 
this is this is an object that people can make that don't need money to make it. It's urgent, it's effective, and it's always associated, obviously, with like it's associated with like rioters and things like that. It's got like a bad associated. I don't, I don't. I'm like somewhat on sometimes on the opposite side of like I'm the one throwing the. I'm in protest. I'm for protest. You know, and so like wait for it. Always is like we'll keep protesting and we keep going through like these different kinds of revolution and every generation has their own, we're not the first one, you know, we most certainly won't be the last. And so that endless swaying, I mean the, the, the video has no end or beginning, it just, you don't see it start to sway, you don't see it end to sway. And that's kind of alluding to this thing that just feels like it's never coming because it just happens every time we, we try and we fight for change and we, we think we're getting there, but it just, it seems so unattainable right now that it's frustrating. So it's like, wait for it. And we've been waiting for it and we'll continue to wait for it um, with the hope that there, there is an end, you know? Um, but it just, I made it right now thinking that right now it just doesn't seem like there's an end. You know, there's so much work to be done and you know can't expect it to just do it in, 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 in my lifetime but it just it was just kind of looking and reflecting on how long we've actually been fighting for liberation as black people and how exhausting it is and how we're still doing it and our mothers and i'm gonna die and our children are gonna still be doing this thing and yeah and so that um the, the petrol bomb in the video was um, and cast in cement and plaster and mixed with cloth. And so the reason I put, um, the reason I put and or cast it in cement was me kind of merging these like two kinds of like weapons people use, you know, um, in strikes and in riots, um, which is the brick like with the message on it sometimes and the petrol bomb. So that was me trying to merge this to make like the ultimate revolutionary weapon. And yeah, I'm, it's still in progress. I'll continue finding ways to make weapons for us. And yeah, so that's, that's, that's the it that we're kind of waiting for. Like, just most importantly, our land, man. Yeah. Um, so following from this revolutionary um, train that we're on, very important. I want to ask you about this work. Um, so the title of this diptych is taken from Memphis speech by Winnie Mandela made on 13th of April 1986. The title is Together Hand in Hand with Our Matches and Our Necklaces We Shall Liberate This Country. Um, and from this speech Winnie was accused of endorsing necklacing and other forms of violent protest in a particularly volatile period in our country. Um, I'm just interested to know how for you this work, how this title and the speech relates to this work, because I find this work extremely powerful. The fact that it's Fabriano um, wetted with petrol and then with these matchsticks embossed on it, it's like the remnants of the tool of igniting is there. And you have this highly flammable object in this space, or in this work, and it's just it's just incredible. And I'd just like to ask you if you can elaborate on that a bit, with Winnie Mandela being a feminist protester and being part of that period of that transitional period in our country's history, which was so vastly important at the time. Um, okay, so um, I kind of gravitated to Mom Winnie's um, uh, quote because I, I found it to, to be extremely powerful and unapologetic. Um, didn't feel it was really an endorsing violence, but like, you know, another thing I'm trying to do in my work is to kind of uh, show people different, like, forms of violence and um, it's very it's very important that people kind of understand 
what the person is saying and from what point of view and not just kind of have a single-minded view of violence. And so for me, it was a woman fighting, you know, and, and the, most of these, um, like, in terms of our past, it's like mostly men who are at the forefront of fighting, uh, fighting to liberate us, right? And she was just aggressive and whatever, and it was just like a thing, like, okay, because surely men are, have been more, far more aggressive, but now it's a problem when it's a whole woman, a whole mother who's now talking about necklacing. And for me, it's just like people forget um, the strength and power and how women have been on the forefront when we get no recognition because simply people don't, um, they don't pair women with violence. Violence then pairs with strength. So you don't see us as being able to fight, you know. And for me, I, I, I was like, there's, there's no way. We're simply, and I, I saw myself as a person, or like I saw a bit of myself in her, and I could identify with that strength, with that urgency that she always had. And I thought, I want in my work to always speak about resistance and strength and power, you know, as like, as a black woman, as like it coming, that is the source. And we are able to fight, you know, and be on the forefront um, the same way, or even like better than men, you know. And even then they're fighting, they come back, you know, and who's holding the home down? We are, you know. So I, I like the work that I did, yes, the, the ingredients are, to make an actual petro bomb with, without one being there. And I always try to kind of include some ingredient of it and to always just kind of make it so volatile. And it's, I mean, I'm, I mean, even me, I'm speaking, I'm not promoting violence. I don't think she's promoting violence, but you do what needs to be done. Like violence, our violence is like, being pushed to, to the point of having to protest and be a violent people in the first place. That is a deep psychological violence that we're still dealing with. So when people see people, uh, when people see us like throwing petrol bombs and fighting and doing all these things, they do not understand all of the frustrations and the different ways we try to actually get the attention of people before that. Nobody, nobody sees all of that that came before. They just wish to see the violent part, not understanding that that is your last resort to be heard when you've been ignored, and you're you you don't even have your basic necessity. You have to fight for basic things in life, mm -hmm. and that that whole thing of getting to that point where we're burning tires and we we're doing we're burning buildings and we looting shops and things like that. That. Like, I, don't, I can't even imagine what, like, people, like, what they've had to go through to get there. Because I'm pretty sure they didn't grow up just thinking, okay, that's what I'm going to do, that's okay. No. They grew up not having, always asking, always being ignored. And that, that for me, is the most incredible amount of violence because now, at some stage, now you start seeing yourself differently. It changes you as a person. Now you are that. And that is all people see at the end of the day. So when people speak about, oh, these barbaric protesters and things like that, I get really upset. Because I'm like, you don't, have you asked yourself what modes of kind of interaction and negotiation these people were trying to do? And they know what gets the people's attention. It's the bad stuff, you know? So, yeah, sorry, like, <laughs> I just went off on a tangent. But, yeah, that's, that's how I, I just felt, um, you know, Winnie kind of fits into my work. And she kind of, her saying that makes sense to me in terms of protests uh, within work and without work, uh, protest to, to, for us to have like better lives. But also, it's just, I love it because she's aggressive and she's unapologetic and she will do what it needs you know, what needs to be done for her people, and I think that's a very important thing, and that's something I'm definitely trying to do in some way. Um, yeah. Um, some of your work makes reference to a controversial political moment, which is quite provocative. 
How important is it for contemporary artists to push all boundaries surrounding social, political, subject matters through their work? I definitely can't speak of all artists. I mean, uh, I don't detect, and I can't say what people should make work about. I definitely think people should, you know, make work about what touches them deeply, um, because I mean, at the end of the day, you need to make something that uh, work about something that fuels you. So whether it's political or non-political, or social, or whatever, I, I mean, I can't say. But for me, this is my life. This is what I'm living. It, my life is very political. I don't even have a choice in it, imagine. So there's, there, I, I don't have a choice. Like This is my frustrations. All of my frustrations stem from this, this anger, this fire. M making work and wanting to live a better life. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people want to live nice lives, right? So. Even me, I want to live a nice life, but <laughs> in, in doing so, I've got all of these boundaries and these hoops to jump, and that's 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 me. I can't. My work is my life. It's it's. I can't separate it. I make work about where I'm specifically at at that particular time, and what I feel is most urgent, not only to me, and but to other people who share their thoughts about my work with me and who share their stories with me. And so, you know, that's why, um, excuse me, um, that's why I find it like, I'm, I'm always just like, very passionate, very frustrated, very um, angry sometimes when I, when I speak of work, because I know I'm not even just speaking of my own experiences, I'm speaking about a lot of people's experiences. And I'm, I'm like, I'm just not simply here just to make nice work. I'm literally trying to shift or change or do something. And that's what I feel is like. If I can do that in however way, if it means just a room of people having a conversation that they don't want to have, or people thinking about things that they wouldn't normally think about, which maybe will lead to some kind of action of, of change, then that, that's fine. You know, I simply like, too many people are, are afraid to offend or be offensive and things like that, and I don't really care for that. I mean, for me, I'm just like, if this is what we really need to talk about, then this is what we need to talk about. And I've learned to be very stern and unapologetic and not trying to always, you know, cater to someone else's comfort because I'm living amidst discomfort. So, um, so yeah. Right. Um, who are some of the contemporary artists or artists in general, in general you are influenced by? <laughs> uh, I always struggled with that question. I mean, influenced by, I, I struggle with that part of influenced by, I think maybe like I'm subconsciously, I may be influenced by a lot of people, a lot of people's work. Um, but I, I, I definitely can't and don't really want to name names because there's, there's a lot of people I don't, I don't look for influence. I, I mean, I'm constantly looking and seeing at people's work, but I, I don't know, man. I just, I don't have no role models in this art game. Um, <laughs> besides the women that I make art with, because I'm, because I work so closely with them, um, I would say they are pretty much the most important and influential people in my art making. And those are the, you know, the, the, the members of my collective. Um, so besides anyone else, I, I just, it's too far removed. Um, yeah, I think they, they are pretty much the most important women in my life and in my work right now. Um. What are some of the challenges you have encountered as a young South African artist? Why do you look scared? Not enough opportunities to show work in, in, like, in spaces. It's a thing. You know, you need, to, you, know, you need to travel, you need to kiss ass at these exhibitions, and I'm, I, 
I, I, I'm not a person who can do that. I'm not really good at pretending. I like people, unfortunately, because damn it, if I was, I would go far, man. Um, <laughs> no, for real. And so it's, it's challenging to be able, because you want to make work about something, you're excited about work, but then where are you going to show it? Also, you must sell it also. Imagine, you have to make money. And, you, and it's, just, it's so limiting in terms of your own vision and what you want to make. Now you need to think, okay, this thing has to be a whole commodity, so somebody needs to make money. If you're not going to make money, you're not going to show. So as a young artist out of university, I always have to kind of make sure that I make the work that I want to make, but also make work that can sell. Yo, that's a lot. Because I just, I just want to disrupt spaces. I want to do things that nobody wants to buy that. And I already know, even before I graduated, was told that it's unlikely that people are going to buy my stuff because I would make work that is difficult to be around physically. And um, so when you make work like that, as a young artist, it's even, it's even more um, difficult and, and challenging to kind of navigate and to get your work across to, uh, to, to people and have people view it. But I just really wish there was just more opportunities for us that allow us to kind of fully express our creative um, ideas and not have to worry about selling, not putting that pressure because in pressure you, you, we're compromising our work, you know. And I think um, I think that's one of the many things that we have to kind of constantly navigate. And yeah, so because I I spaces to show work, I think that's the most challenging part. And then on that note, can you tell us anything about what you've got planned for the future or speak about your um, 2017 body of work, um, Strangers Location? you want to speak about that? <coughs> tell us a bit about it? Because there's new work that we haven't seen, which just makes it very interesting. Technically, we're in 2018. Yes. Uh, this was done in 2017. So there's a new body of work coming up, but this was just um, the result of my two years of my master's. And uh, Strangers Location basically is just the name um, that was given to the Red Location before it came, became Red Location. That I mean, so the history of New Bright goes a little something like this. Um, we were living, minding our own business, you know, amongst ourselves, chilling, living our best lives. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, you know, colonizers came, you know, I'm not going to teach our history, you know what they did. And so, in doing so, there's a thing for the South African War, that's what they're calling it now, they kind of shipped in horses um, for the war. And I think in like in the horse, in the horse water, there was like it, it was um, there was a virus in there, so it literally spread the bubonic plague. But what happened is that they blamed it um, on 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 the black people, and a lot of us died. Actually, more black people died. But get this, they made a, a memorial. They, they made a memorial for the horses that died. Um, <laughs> right? You're testing us, man. Um, <laughs> They made a memorial for the horses that died, and then, and then having blamed us, moved us away. So that was their reason for moving us away, and in doing so, creating the first locations. And this one was called Strangers Location. And it was literally just survivors and, and family members of the people who had survived the plague and were and removed. Ah, there, there's that beautiful thing. <laughs> um, so that still stands. It's got a whole soldier, bucket of water, horse, and yo. Oh. Uh, it's a very violent thing to actually walk past. And when I and because sometimes you just don't even bother to look at the history of the place that you're staying in. I've seen these things for so long until I made, I started making work about New Brighton. I got to read up about it, and and then and then I was like, how? Like, how does this even make sense? First, you're gonna just write us out of history like that after you killed us. 
and then you're going to memorialize a horse as as like yo nah it's 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 painful and it's upsetting man like and how people defend it and uh, and I've obviously I've I posted work about make about this and like writing up about it and my peers who I studied with that that side have been defending it and saying how can I you know how can I want this horse you know statue to go down and I just and I just wonder if they if they read up about it and where because you know sometimes definitely history wasn't written by us or for us um, so I I don't think they're getting the right information but I don't see how how that thing is still up there because it's like a big fuck you basically to us and it's my mission in life one of my many missions but it's my mission in life to get that thing down I don't know how but that's why I think I will always continue making work about it as long as it still stands. Because I just think it's disrespectful. It's disrespectful. You, you do not acknowledge us at all in this whole thing. And it's like a horse's life is more important than a black life. Of course. So, and that's, and, and that's the kind of scenario that kind of plays out in all different other forms out here in this world. So, um, yeah, black lives are literally a pit, of, pit bottom. So, and, yeah. Um, sorry, I even lost track of what I was even talking about in the first place. Um, I mean, you can just talk about your work that you're making now. Oh, um, yeah. The feature. I, I have a show coming up at the end the March beginning of April and it's kind of continuing this conversation and looking at home and homelessness and um, kind of playing around with that and what it looks like and what are the, the, the contributing factors to that and um, yeah it's a very it's a very challenging um, thing to think about constantly on every day because in thinking about this work I, I need to think about my experiences, I need to think about where we are currently and it's, you know, you go your day to day and you get, um, you get lost in conversation, you, you don't think about these things and obviously now I'm living in an observatory, I'm not living in the township, also I'm like, like visually I'm just, and in terms of experience I'm, I'm removed from that but then I'm gonna go home in a month's time and then again, you know? So it's like having to constantly remind myself what it is that I'm making work for, why I'm making why I'm making that work. It's a it's a it's a very difficult thing to have to constantly like think about on a daily basis because it's sad. It's sad because it hasn't changed because people they're still using bucket systems back home and you're walking to work in a whole truck and but then they're gonna yeah so um that's that's what i'm working towards right now and um got a few other projects but i won't go into that but yeah um strangers strangers location was just also me trying to make people familiar with port elizabeth and where i come from you know a lot of in terms of like a history um, the famous t like places, Soweto, District 6, are, are the ones that, you know, get a lot of attention. But like, here, at, in my own home, I want to bring forth my city and um, our experiences and, you know, just kind of trying to put us on the map also. Um, so, I, I literally, I mean, I, I love the place that I live in. And it's because I love it so much that I, I'll never stop fighting for it as much as I'm doing now. And it's also where my, my mother and my family live. You know, it's my home. So, um, yeah, I, I, I thought, I mean, what else to make a whole body of work about than, than where you live and its current state? Um, yeah. Thank you for... Um answering all our questions. Um, we'd now like to open the floor for any questions from members of the audience. Hi, 
Hi. I just wanted to find out from you how your work has sort of been received. Um, I do realize that you have been showing in spaces outside of South Africa, so different audiences have been experiencing your work. And uh, in your interaction with your audiences, how have they been receiving this? Um, okay, so, yeah, I, I, I think I've shown work in two places outside, but um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be at both because one, I had to be here uh, in Istanbul, but I, I heard like the, the response was really great, and which is which is something that's very heartwarming. I mean, obviously, the work and the work changes as soon as it's in a different context. People read it differently, which is something um, I find found quite nice because it still related very well to the place, um, and that is just speaking specifically of like the long piece and and that work having to like addressing um, and it addressing basically the the luxuries um, um, of, of having land um, the luxuries of having a lawn like a lawn seems like a very basic thing but definitely there's there's not a lot of those uh, where I come from we definitely have like a very dodgy small patch of grass and you know, and just kind of seeing these um, places in the suburbs and these big lawns, and I'm like, my land, <laughs> but I don't even have you to wake up to. So it's just like kind of like gentrification, also like just removing people uh, from from their homes and things like that, and finding that that is the same situation that is happening in a whole Istanbul was just mind blowing first, but it was good that they were able to see a work on like receive it the way they did and find connections with it in um, in a different space and then the other place i showed at was in london funny story um <laughs> denied a visa twice <laughs> and i was very upset because i'm like how are they denying visa <laughs> see now i'm gonna get myself into trouble how are they denying a visa um, to South African, black South African citizens when they didn't come with visas on our land. <laughs> you know, they didn't come with visas. You're gonna have all of these restrictions, but you can't, you, 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 now all of a sudden, we, we need to pay money to go into, but you came here with the little papers. And <laughs> so I was really, I was pissed off. And they reasoned, their reasoning was ridiculous, it was some bullshit. So I can't even, I wasn't able to be around my work to actually even see like how it was revealed um, because of, you know, I'm sorry if I'm offending you, I'm actually I'm not sorry. Um, British people, I, no, man. So yeah, I, unfortunately I can't, I can't tell you that. Even me till this day, I don't know how they received it, but um, I hope it was a big fuck you to them. Um, I I exhibited a, a a bed piece with a petrol and some neon lights with sleeping pool and a video. I'm um, sorry, it's not in this presentation, uh, but it's a, a work that I just made and I haven't exhibited actually here in South Africa, funny enough. Um, and that was the first place it showed. Um, yeah, but hopefully uh, I'll be able to come uh, bring the work down and show it to people. Hi, yeah. uh, thank you so much for your talk and for your artwork. Um, I'm from Ireland, so I've been living in America for a while. And I think Northern Ireland in particular would recognize a lot of the themes in your work, the petrol bomb, a, a feeling that this is the only way that uh, people who aren't being heard can make themselves heard, and then feeling like they're reduced to a petrol bomb. Um, mm -hmm. I would love for you to have an opportunity to display your work in Northern Ireland someday and in parts of America and in Detroit, I think, would also feel uh, a very... Uh, Come through with the contact. <laughs> like, I'm ready. And so, well, what, what I'm wanting to say is, um, do you feel it's important for artists who are engaged in protest uh, to reach across and find commonality with others fighting different struggles or similar struggles in other parts of the world? I definitely think 
I, I just think, like, just as odd as I, for, for myself, obviously, I think it's important to reach out and find out what other people are doing and why they're doing it. I think it can only enrich um, one's own work, and especially if they're fighting, and why they're fighting, because, um, but, like, also, it, it's up to a person. Sometimes, you know, you don't even get to that point because you, you're busy. You're busy fighting here. You know, uh, you don't have the luxury actually of traveling and going to other spaces. But it is always good to have conversations with other people who are protesting and more active than they were. Because, you know, you feed off of that same kind of urgency and you find maybe different ways. Like, it's like learning a different language. Therefore, you can communicate to an extra group of people that maybe you were not able to communicate to before. So I think there's definitely like value um, in doing that, but it's a difficult movement. is a very difficult thing. Uh, I definitely love to go and show in all of these spaces and have my work show there and kind of hear from them how they receive it. Um, but yeah, like I, opportunities are very scarce, especially when you're starting out. And yeah, so that's going to change. Um, any more questions from audience members? No. <laughs> Such a weird system. I know. <laughs> Hi, thank you for sharing your time in such, yeah, such a vulnerable and great temple. Um, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned about the anger that you feel just with regards to our history and present and your lived experience. Um, back home and in Cape Town. I just wanted to ask, um, as, an, as a creator, obviously there's an element of catharsis in your work. I wanted to find out if, um, like, uh, how much do you feel that your creations ease that anger and how much do you feel that it fuels that anger? Good question. <laughs> um, Yo. You know what, like with the first body of work, the burnt works, that was, that was for me very like cathartic. You know, burning I found, I find even just like something as, something soothing, something very meditative. I was able to, like in just in the process of making the work, I found a lot of healing in it. And it, this definitely hasn't been a process in terms of this work. Obviously I get rattled up, I, I start to think of things um, and this is why like, somebody always keeps noting like your work is really aggressive and it's actually quite violent. And I thought, okay, well, it's because of like, what I'm feeling. I'm not even like, consciously putting in those emotions. I'm, like, I'm not even trying to release to the work. Like, so I, won't, I don't know how, like, I think it's just, it changes every time, you know. Um, I, but I, I would say it feels more than than rather like it being a very cathartic, very calming kind of an experience. I definitely think it it hypes me up a little bit, um, gets me a little bit crazy. Um, but I mean, you know, with each piece, and also kind of depending on what the actual piece or the installation is, it does something different. And so I just kind of allow myself to just respond to the work however and not really worry about me just emptying everything into to my work. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Sure. Hey, um, I just wanted, maybe you could um, talk a little bit about why, when I see a work, I always feel like it's kind of um, has a very particular resonance inside um, art galleries and museums, um, as opposed to outside, because you often use materials that you already find outside. Like you said, you can find a discarded petrol bomb after everyone's been put in the van or whatever, or you can 
there's a lot of things that we already know or see like outside. So I wanted to ask, um, do you have, with as artists, I think here we're a little bit um, limited. We don't have as many like off spaces, project spaces as Europe. Um, so often we find ourselves putting our work directly into very formal kind of spaces. But I think that's, it feels like it's important in your work. Um, but I wanted to ask what's, what do you think the relationship of your work within the art gallery and the art industry and the art market is? And if you're saying something specific into that space as well. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it tend, like, when I make the work, obviously in the beginning I'm not making it for a gallery, actually, I don't even make it for any particular space. Um, and the work obviously finds itself there because it, it looks nice on white walls or something like that. And, but also, like, it is important for my work to be in these spaces because um, the issues I'm addressing and I and I kind of like I know the kind of people that come into these spaces and those are the ones I feel are not having the conversations that need to be had and so that's why I want to put my work in there so that you can't have just a very blase conversation about oh look at this note I'm targeting the people the wealthy people that come into these spaces to actually think about to think about um, uh, our current state socially as a people, and you know, and how it's like this is this is something that you should be focusing your not only like your attention, your money, and everything too. And I'm I'm addressing you know obviously it's predominantly white audience, and so I'm 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 always like this. It's fine. I'm okay with my work. Um, being, being put in this in this rigid spaces because I understand who exactly needs uh, to be seeing this and I all, I'm always having or trying to have um, these conversations with these spaces that who also don't even like um, allow enough of us in them you know and and I, so I, w I won't not I will not go into it I'm trying to infiltrate I'm trying to change the spaces I'm trying to make you know, the, the one black artist a whole year like not a thing. I wanted to to own kind of to create some kind of ownership of that space and in allowing my work and to be there sometimes I feel um, if if I am able or given um, leeway to do what I want with the space to kind of reclaim that um, to reclaim that space. But um, I mean my work is you know like dealing with like uh, power systems of structure and whatever the galleries are exactly those kinds of things um, so yeah I mean yeah so I've been asked like how you're speaking against these things and yet you're showing your work in the gallery I'm like yeah well we all have different uh, strategies of infiltration <laughs> this is mine <laughs> and <laughs> and it, and it works and I'm speaking I'm, I'm there's a method to my madness but you know, I don't want to limit my work to just one particular audience because how we're living socially affects everybody. So, um, but the people who are in power right now um, will frequent those spaces more than if I were to show in the townships and a lot of people won't. And the, now we're just talking amongst ourselves mm. as opposed to having a conversation with a wider variety of people. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, you speak about um, the spaces and uh, trying to get into them. Uh, do you think uh, ownership is also uh, something that artists should consider um, trying to have a stake in the spaces that you'll be showing in? And do you think that's impossible in a way? Anyway, is it something you think about? Um, yeah, that's that's a nice idea. Actually, I haven't thought about it. I don't know. <laughs> but it would it would be nice because then, you know, then it's not the token black person showing at a gallery once a year anymore. 
then we have a little bit more say of also there's like no censorship if we can also have a say in like what kinds of conversations are we allowing ourselves to have in these spaces and the moment that artists kind of you know um, have or have a little bit of ownership in those spaces I think it will allow for it to be more flexible more progressive and um, um, like and just more more urgent like yeah, I don't know how to explain it, but I, I think it would only benefit us to try and actually, you know, have some, like, um, say in the spaces. So it's not just um, someone just simply going, oh, you can only be here for a certain amount of time, but also you being saying this is my space and that this is the kind of change that I think we should make. It could only benefit us as, as artists, I think. Any more questions? Mm. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I liked what you said about the horse memorial uh, and the lack of a black uh, monument to the blacks who died in Anglo Boer War. There were 89 black concentration camps in Anglo Boer War. And that's been forgotten by history. 20,000 blacks died in those concentration camps. There were black soldiers and assistants on both sides of the war, and they've been forgotten. There is actually, there are actually two memorials to the blacks who died in the group war, but they're in the wrong places. One is at Spionkop, and the other one is actually, there's a beautiful monument up near Rustenburg at a place called Kida Lodge. Uh, it's an arch with several statues, really beautiful, but it's in the wrong place. We need a really prominent um, uh, memorial. And I think this is probably the place to start the idea of all these artists. I'd be, I'm not an artist, but I'd be quite prepared to get involved and help get this thing on the road. And I think some, some of your mates and colleagues could get involved and get something going. Right. Um, I just have also, like, just a a difficulty with just like memorials in essence. I'm not a, a belief, like, well, I have a problem with statues, let me just say, like, <laughs> I don't mess with them, I don't understand why they're there looking up. I, I am, yeah, I, I, yeah, so I wouldn't want to, it's difficult, like, not to say I wouldn't want to remember or create something in memory of, but it wouldn't be in the form of a memorial, I think. Um, I don't know what form it would be. I'd have to take my time in thinking in what way I'd like to, to honor, but definitely I'm, I'm for taking away those statues, not trying to like add more into that collection. Um, but that... That's just me. I, I, just, I don't understand um, that that form of like memor like memor like that. What is the word? Memorial. You got it. And so um, I just think there's just other ways of remembering that that kind of stay with you more. Um, but thank you for for telling me for telling me that. Uh, okay. Maybe I can talk louder. So um, I wanted to ask, um, I'm pretty sure this is a question that you've asked yourself too. Um, as an emerging artist, South African emerging black artist, did you at some point not feel that the work that you are doing right now, or, or when you thought about it, or the work that you'll be doing, which is the work that you are doing now, didn't you at some point feel that it's uh, it's more of the obvious route. Like I sometimes feel that this is kind of what's expected from most black emerging artists to 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 talk about the subjugated body. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but what I'm what I'm trying to ask you is that how did you deal with that and you, you seem to be handling it quite well. Basically, how did you handle that? Um, <laughs> the 
it's a, it's a funny one. Um, I mean, in terms of like making the obvious, um, you say my life is obvious, okay. But <laughs> I'm, I never look, look, looked at it that way. I never even thought about it in that way. I thought I was making something about people, about something that people aren't really addressing properly and efficiently and with enough urgency. That's what I thought I was making work about. And I mean, I'm black, I can't avoid that, man. Um, I mean, what else would you, like, you know, I just, it was a no-brainer. I was like, I'm not gonna paint flowers when, first of all, paint is expensive, I don't have the money, and, 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 and. Uh, I just, I didn't see any other way, and if someone thinks it's like, this is a typical black whatever, well, we're black, this is what we're dealing with, and typical or not, if you're sick and tired of hearing it, you're gonna keep hearing it because we're not going to stop because this is our lives. It's not even just a concept, it's not a subject matter. It's a life, it's an experience. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much unapologetic about that. And yeah, I'm coping, I'm coping. <laughs> I mean, I guess to that, if, if, if these issues are so obvious, then, uh, you, you should obviously understand why they're being repeated. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I guess that's the response to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just... Um, I, I wanted to talk about, I mean, you know, we look at some of the, the elements in your work, for instance, uh, just going to open this. Because I was making notes as you were talking, a lot of it, you know, it's, it's, it's really moving in terms of how um, some of it is not intentional, and but then the way in which it ends up, you know, opening up a door to another way of perceiving things. For instance, when we were talking about the divider and how, um, you know, the intertwined uh, bed sheets can be seen either on so many levels. Also talking to, you know, the obesity of it, you know, and how you can kind of see right through it and, you know, what's separating the private space to the public space is almost, you know, almost non-existence, you know, and um, talking to also the idea of home, and um, I'll make an example with how the, the, the concept of of uh, even like squatter camps, for instance, if you look at Alexandra in, in, in Johannesburg, uh, where you get like this huge, you know, landscape full of um, squatter camps with people living in really small spaces, while right next door is Santon with huge acres of land, uh, there's an acre of one or single families. And you know how that concept in your work can really kind of apply to so many other subjects in, 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 in what's wrong with our country or what's really problematic in the way we see things. And would you say as an artist that's something that you kind of almost try to look at and, and, and see how one concept or your narrative can stretch out to what's the narratives of how others are living in the country? Mm. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously uh, most of my work has just come from like just um, very close and very personal narratives, but I, I, I do speak to people and some of the work, it would even like be influenced by someone else's stories and, um, and the more and more I researched and made work I, and the more I spoke to people, I found this is, my, my experience is not special. You know, it's not the only one. Um, a lot of people kind of share in, in what I'm going through and that is the, the, the beauty and the sad part of it also at the same time. Um, so I, I do sometimes consciously try and like, think and not to, just to make it too personal, um, but and try and kind of think on the wider scope of things and kind of look, so I'd look intensely at, um, the location that I'm working on, but then I'm also trying to look in terms of the whole country and um, how how it kind of filters out or how where else it pops up and what was different about this and what has been done on those or has somebody you know been speaking about this from that particular area that I don't know. So I always try and kind of um, try and know more about something that. Um, connects to us like socially and just trying to gather as many kind of like experiences just through sharing stories um, 
Yeah, I try and, but I don't, it's not like the main thing, but you know, sometimes you can make something about something you think this is just specific and then find that it's really not, and it just kind of actually is able to connect to various other narratives, um, not even just in the, your specific place of, of, of living. So um, I've been finding that my work, obviously, I'm speaking about something that has happened all over this country and probably the world as the gentleman over there said, you know. So, yeah, I, I don't think um, we can ever avoid that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would be the last question of the time, mm -hmm. so. Um, yeah, I'm going to try and verbalize an idea, but I think it's going to sound a little disjointed. Okay. But it's something to do with, it's something to do with your comment about <clears throat> your feelings around um, memorialization and um, monumentalization and how this building that we're sitting in feels very much like the monument of the contemporary. Mm -hmm. And then I think about the work that you make and about like the artist and what happens like after you make the work. You have an urgency to make it and then does it become like the abject where you don't feel you want to see it anymore like you said you don't want to see your old work mm -hmm. or is it something that you have great sentimentality to because I want to commend you about your, like, I feel it's super brave to speak about your own personal life and bring your mother's bed sheets into something. <laughs> to, like, you know, but like, this is the first seven years of your life that divide it. Um, and then have it be in this monumentalized, like, the totem of the contemporary right now. And then people like walking past it and maybe not even like giving it a moment's thought, like how like how like like how does that make you feel? To have your work live in this and then to have to either be like rejected or deeply appreciated or not even considered at all. Um listen, when I make a work, um I make it with that urgency and that emotion at the time. And obviously, like with this work, I was happy that, um, because, you know, when you work, make work, have an exhibition for a month, and then all of that, and you get a month <laughs> to show it in, and then that's it. And so obviously, I was happy for this to kind of come up again, and to be, um, to create some um, connections with new people and whatever, but also at the same time, when I'm done with something and it's out of my hands, if it does not come back to my studio, I don't know it. I detach myself from it. I, I feel nothing. So literally, this whole building can burn down with the word, I would feel nothing at all. Um, I've... <laughs> there are more fires. I'm not... <laughs> we ain't got water. Listen. Um, I, can't, I can't promise no more fires. <laughs> Being in fires are you know, always going to be a part of my life. But I'm not saying I'm going to burn sides down. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, maybe. We'll see. Um, but, yeah, I just kind of, I detach. And, you know, I can't expect that what I make will touch everybody, you know, in the same way. And that's just something that's part of like that detachment. I've allowed it to just live its own life and, you know, it will connect with whoever it does and it won't, you know, I, mean, I, I, I don't, it's not something that I carry really with me. Um, it's nice, I only, I'm only happy when like more people get to see the work, but um, I'm very interested, even if it's received negatively, I always want to know how, why, okay, so that I can talk because I'm concerned with making myself better and my work better. And so um, that's what I try and like take from like feedback and where the work is. But um, I'm not sentimental about the work at all. I've definitely destroyed some of the works that you're seeing there. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks once again to Lisa. Thank you for joining us today. 
Thank you for putting up with all our questions, interrogating your work. It was really, really interesting, and I feel I've learned so much, so much more than I would have learned having not spoken to you. So thank you for taking up the time. And thanks to everyone who came and listened in today, for everyone asking questions and being interested in being open to learning, because that's what we all need to do all the time. Thanks again. Thank you.